I'm going to ask that we all bow our heads in prayer, every head bowed and every eye closed. For many thousands of people here today, this will be an hour of decision, and you will never be the same today. Even if you refuse Christ, you'll never be the same. Once you've faced him, once you've heard the gospel and rejected it, you can never be the same. It says when the rich young ruler rejected Christ, he turned away grieved, emotionally disturbed, because when you reject the claims of Christ, that's a very serious thing. It will be an hour of decision for many of you who receive him today. Your life will never be the same. Your home will never be the same. So let's listen carefully and prayerfully today and reverently to the message of the Word of God. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank Thee for this love of God that reaches around the world and engulfs all of mankind. Thou dost love the Russians and the Chinese as much as Thou dost love the British or the Americans or the African. Thou dost love the whole world, and Thou didst send Thy Son to die for the whole world. And we're all included in Thy redemption plan. And we thank Thee that at this hour of history we can stand and proclaim good news that God is love and that God is willing to forgive. We pray that many this day will receive that message, accept it and act on it and live by it. For we ask it in His name, Amen. Now today I want you to turn with me to Luke's Gospel, the 11th chapter. The 11th chapter of Luke's Gospel, beginning with verse 29. Beginning with verse 29. I hope you have your Bibles. Now the 29th chapter, or the 11th chapter and the 29th verse of Luke's Gospel. And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign. And there shall no sign be given it but the sign of Jonah, the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign unto Nineveh, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Now, ancient Israel wanted Jesus to do something sensational to prove that he was really the Son of God. But Jesus is saying in this passage, you're seeking for a sign. All right, I'll give you a sign. I am the sign. And Jesus was saying that the people of Jonah's day listened to the message of God and repented, and they're going to rise up at the judgment as witnesses against the people of Jesus' day that rejected him. He said the Queen of the South recognized the wisdom of Solomon, but he said in me you have a greater wisdom than all the wisdom of Solomon. He said you're blind. You cannot see the truth. You're deaf and you cannot hear the truth. He said I'm the truth. I'm the light of the world. I'm the sign. Now, when you face Jesus, what is your reaction? When you're confronted with Jesus Christ, what is your reaction? The reaction of the scribes and the Pharisees was one of hostility. The people of Nineveh's day were humbled and repented when they faced and confronted God. And the question that we all ask today is this question. What think ye of Christ? There's a rock opera at the moment called Jesus Christ the Superstar. 
All over the country, thousands of young people are talking about Christ. They can't escape him. There's a Broadway play right now entitled Godspell, a musical version of St. Matthew's Gospel. There's a new movie right now called Brother John in which Sidney Poitier plays Jesus Christ in the form of an Alabama black man. The front cover of Life magazine a few weeks ago ran Jesus Christ Superstar. And this rock opera from England was confronting young people with one question. Who is Jesus Christ? An 87 minute long electronic probe into the life of Jesus. Who is Jesus? And the opera concludes with the voice of Judas coming back from the dead and still questioning who Jesus is. Don't get me wrong, says Judas in the opera. I only want to know. And then the haunting chorus follows Jesus Christ Superstar. Do you think you are what they say you are. Jesus Christ, do you think you are what they say you are? It's interesting to me that in 1971, the plays, the books, the operas, the movies about Jesus, our generation cannot escape Jesus. And when Good News for Modern Man came out, a new translation of the New Testament by the American Bible Society, they sold 25 million copies. We cannot escape Jesus. I've never heard of an opera or a play even about Buddha or Muhammad or Gandhi. But our generation has become hung up on Jesus. Young people are talking about Jesus. He's the subject of conversation today on the campus, in the high schools, everywhere. Young people are discussing Jesus Christ and they're asking the question, who is he? Who is this Jesus? We cannot escape him. You remember that day when Saul, who was persecuting Christians, was on the road to Damascus? And a blinding light came, and he fell down, and the first question he asked was, Who art thou, Lord? The question that our generation of young people on the campus are asking today is, Who art thou, Lord? Who is Jesus? Why cannot we escape him? Why is he in our conscience and in our mind so that our plays and our poems and our operas are about him? Is he just a revolutionary hero? Or is he something more? He only lived 33 years. He never traveled more than 100 miles. He never had any formal education. And yet 2,000 years later, an entire generation is talking about Jesus Christ. Some say that he was a madman. Some of the people of his day said he was mad, said he was a maniac. Was he? There were others that said he was revolutionary. He'd come to lead a revolution. Was he a revolutionary? In the sense that he changed men's lives, he was, but he never led a revolution against Rome. He never led a revolution against the existing authorities. As a matter of fact, some of them tried to get him to and some of them thought he was going to. And when they found out that he was building a spiritual kingdom, they were no longer interested in him. And when they tried to tempt him about that, he said, bring me a coin. And he said, whose picture's on that coin? They said, Caesar. He said, all right, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And the scripture says they quit asking him questions. They didn't know how to answer that. Or was Jesus an establishment man? Some people say that he represented the status quo. Some people say that Jesus Christ is the one upon which Western culture has been built and that America is really Jesus 
organization on earth. Well, I want to tell you, if his organization depends on the bureaucracy we built up in Washington, we're finished. There's not much hope for the world. Jesus Christ is not the establishment Christ. He's building another kingdom. He's building an eternal kingdom. And then there's some people that say that he was the first hippie. They said he had long hair, went around with his disciples in a commune. You know, actually, we don't know what he looked like. We don't know whether he had a long beard or not. Those are just pictures that artists have painted. We think he did. We don't know whether he had long hair or not. He probably did because the people of that day, that was the style, but we don't know. We don't have a picture of Jesus and God did that purposely so that we would not be worshiping an image because God is a spirit and must be worshiped in spirit. And then there were people that said that he was deliberately evil, that he was an evil man, that he was a devil. What was he? That's the question. Jesus Christ, who are you? Who is Jesus? We can't escape him. We try to run from him, but there he is. He keeps popping up everywhere. Our greatest philosophers write about him. Our greatest historians write about him. Our greatest poems and plays are about him. Our greatest architecture is about him, even in the Soviet Union. You go to the Kremlin. I've been in the Kremlin, and it's all filled with paintings and pictures about Jesus. You go anywhere in the Soviet Union and you'll see images and art and much of the music has to do with Jesus. They can't escape him. Well, we know some things about him. We know he was a man. Jesus was completely human. He was representative of man because the Bible says he was identified, he was numbered with the transgressors. We know that he was hungry, we know he got thirsty, we know he got tired. We know that he had the joys of friendship. We know that he wept at the tomb of a dead loved one. We know that he had all the characteristics of a man, and yet, very interestingly, the Bible says that he never committed a sin. In fact, he stood in front of the people of his generation and he said, I've never committed a sin. He said, if any of you, my neighbors, ever seen me commit a sin? They couldn't say a thing. Now, wouldn't that be something for a man to come along, 33 years of age, and say, who of you have ever seen me commit a sin? Well, I'll tell you, if I said that, all my team would jump straight up and say, I have. My wife's here. All of us are sinners, but Jesus was tempted in every point like as we are. He went through every temptation you've ever been through. There isn't a trial or a testing or a temptation that Jesus has not been through before you and he resisted them and overcame them all. Everyone, he was a man. Just like you. But he was more than that. He claimed to be the unique only begotten, incarnate Son of God. In fact, he claimed pre-existence. The scripture says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Before time began, he existed. He said, before Abraham was, I am. I am in eternal existence. No wonder they got angry. No wonder they threw stones at him. No wonder they tried to kill him. And no wonder they eventually did crucify him. He stood and said, I am God. Was he? Was he who the, he claimed to be? 
the Son of the living God? One day he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter answered and said, well, some of them say you're John the Baptist come back, or you're Jeremiah, or you're Elijah. He said, I'm really not interested in what the people say. I'm interested, Peter, in what you say. What do you say? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Peter, you've done well. You've passed your examination. But Peter, those are not your thoughts. Those thoughts came from God. It has been revealed to you by God. Jesus Christ claimed to be the Son of the living God. And you know, at his incarnation, or his birth, that was not his birth, or that wasn't the beginning, that wasn't the origin of Jesus. That was the beginning, that was the beginning of his incarnation. Because he has always existed. From everlasting to everlasting, he is God, the Bible says. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, the Logos, the Word of God, the eternal God became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ and lived like a man among us. That's what the Bible teaches. And when you come to Jesus Christ, you have to accept that. He wasn't just another revolutionary. He wasn't just another hippie. He was not just another great man. He was God in the flesh. And oh, the ethics that he taught. Never a man spake like that man. When you get hit on one side, he says, turn the other cheek. He never said what to do after that. But he did say, forgive 70 times 7. Count that up. How about the little irritations from your wife or your husband? 70 times 7 you forgive. My wife once said that the secret of a happy marriage is two good forgivers. And that's what it is. Two good forgivers. People that can forgive each other. Jesus taught that we're to forgive. He taught a revolution in the way we're to live. He taught us that it wasn't just our outward actions that God judges, but it's the inward thoughts and intents. He said, Moses said that in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I tell you that if you even look on a woman to lust after her, you've already committed it. He said, Moses said, thou shalt not murder. But I tell you, if you have hate in your heart against your brother without cause, you're already guilty. He lifted man's ethics to the highest plane and demanded that we live that kind of a life. He himself lived that kind of a life. And the scripture says that he judges the inside. The Attorney General of the United States said the other day that America is imperiled more from within than without. And so are you here today in your personal life. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Jesus said, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and thefts and blasphemies. All the evil in the world comes from the human heart. That's got to be changed. And that's why Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be converted. You must have a new beginning. And he can do it. How do you explain Jesus? Jesus Christ, are you what you say you are? You know, they only brought three charges against him to crucify him. One, they said, this man loves sinners. That was one charge. The second, he healed on the Sabbath day. And the third, he claimed to be the Son of God. Was he the Son of God? Look at his authority. Jesus came unto them and spake unto them, saying, All authority has been given to me. I know one thing. He forgave sin, and no prophet ever did that. 
Jesus himself forgave sin. He said, thy sins are forgiven thee. I know that he had authority over nature. One day, he, one night he was in a storm. The lightning was flashing, the thunder was roaring, the sea was raging, the wind was blowing, the disciples were afraid, and Jesus was asleep in the boat, and he stood up in the boat and said, Peace be still. The lightning quit its flashing, and the thunder quit its roaring, and the rain ceased to fall, and the wind quieted down, and the sea quieted down, and nature obeyed him. And our young people believe that today because one of their top tunes at the moment is, put your hand in the hand of the one who calmed the sea. He calmed the sea. He had power over nature. I was flying Cliff Barrows and some of us were flying some time ago. I think we were leaving, we went a typhoon leaving the Philippines. And uh, just before we got out of the typhoon, I was the captain of the plane had invited me to sit up front with him. And it was fairly smooth. We had a lot of rain and all. It wasn't too rough. But all of a sudden, the plane hit something. It seemed to me as though it had hit a wall. It jolted and jerked and quivered and went up and down for about two minutes. And then all of a sudden, we plunged out into brilliant sunshine, into smooth air. And the captain turned to me with the perspiration coming down his face. He said, you know, he said, that was God telling us there's something up here more powerful than this airplane. But Jesus could take a storm like that and turn it around. He could take the lightning and throw it back in the cloud. He has power over nature. Why? Because he's the God of nature. Those are his laws. They're obeying him. He had authority over disease. I read uh, the other day where Mao Zedong in China claims to have cured 80% of all the deaf people in China. And one of those men that came back on the ping pong team said that Mao Zedong is the Jesus Christ of China today. They talk about personality cult. Looks like to me they've got quite a personality over there. But Jesus did make the blind to see. He made the deaf to hear. He made the dumb to talk. He raised the dead. According to the record, he had authority over demons. You say, Billy, do you believe in demons? I surely do. And Jesus confronted demons time after time, and he could cast them out. And people that were insane under the powers of demons would regain their sanity. And then look at the death he died. Did ever a man die like Jesus? The lightning flashed and the thunder roared and the earth began to shake. And even the soldiers confessed that this must be the Son of God. Anyone that can see Jesus on that cross and not be touched has a heart of stone. They first took off his clothes. Then they took long leather thongs with steel pellets or lead pellets on the end and beat him across the back until he could hardly stand up. Then they put a crown of thorns on his brow and his face was bleeding. And they laughed at him and they spit on him and they mocked him. And with one snap of his finger, 72,000 angels had already drawn their swords ready to come to his rescue and wipe this planet out of existence in the universe. And Jesus said, no, to this end was I born. And he dragged and lifted and hauled that cross. And don't you black people ever forget one thing. The man that helped Jesus carry that cross was a black man. And don't ever forget another thing. Jesus belongs to Africa as much as he does to Europe and Asia. He was born in that part of the world that touches Africa and Asia and Europe. And Jesus was not a white man like me. 
nor was he as black as some of you. We don't know what the color of his skin, but it must have been a dark color like the people of his day because he was a man like them. Don't ever say it's a white man's religion or a black man's religion. It's a world religion. He belongs to the world. When he died on that cross and they nailed him, they put the nails in his hands. And you know what he said? Forgive them. They know not what they do. Forgive them. Could you forgive somebody that's putting nails in your hands and you know you didn't deserve it? He didn't squirm. He didn't yell. He didn't scream. He just took it and said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's how he confronted the violence of his day. And then, on the cross, he said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he dropped his head and said, it's finished. What did he mean? He meant your plan of salvation was finished. God can now forgive you of all your sins because Jesus had finished God's plan for your salvation. Because you see, God knows every one of you by name. He has the hairs of your head numbered. God looks upon you as though you were the only person in the whole universe. He sees you and you alone. And on that cross, Jesus had the capacity to think of you. And he loved you enough to stay on the cross. Was there ever such love as that when he could have been rescued and taken back to heaven and to sit on his throne, but he didn't? He said, no, I'm doing it for the joy that is set before me because he saw that he would be raised from the dead. He saw that there would be a gathering in the generations to come of a people for his name that would make up his body. He saw the day when we will reign with him in his kingdom. Yes, they laid him away in a tomb, and that's where Jesus Christ Superstar leaves him. But out in Kansas City, some people got a hold of the rock opera, and they carried it right on to the next step, the resurrection. And if you don't have the resurrection, you don't have any gospel. Jesus Christ is alive. And when they went out to the tomb that morning, they heard the greatest news the world has ever known. He is not here. He is risen. He is alive today. And the thing that inspired the disciples to turn the world upside down in their day was the resurrection. They went everywhere declaring that Jesus is alive. You know, some of us Christians live as though Jesus is dead. He's not dead. He's alive. Oh, you're going through your troubles and your trials and your temptations and your testings and your pressures. And you're under satanic attack all the time, constantly. You know, I think it, in many ways, in some ways, it's easier not to be a Christian in this world because the devil may leave you alone. The moment you receive Christ as Savior, you're in for it unless you live on your knees and live in the scriptures and keep your guard up and have your spiritual armor on at all times. Because if you let down even one day as a Christian, you're in trouble. The moment you receive Christ, you see all the world is going this way. You turn around and start against the tide as a Christian. And that's hard. But you know, it's hard to be a sinner too, the older you get, because the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. I watch sometimes the programs on television where they have crime. I have never in my life seen criminals work so hard for the money they get. It looks like to me they could get a legitimate business and have a much easier time to get their money. They work at it. 
That is, according to the script. And I'm sure they do in real life. Jesus Christ is alive. And if he's not risen from the dead, if he's not alive, then there is no such thing as Christianity. We're yet in our sins, Paul said, and the whole thing's a farce. Forget it. And then the people that have received Christ, what has happened to them? We had uh, a fellow here the other night that was a Black Panther leader. He said that he thought he could change the world through the Black Panther movement until, he said, he met Jesus. And he said Jesus changed his life and took all the hate out. And now he said, I believe the world can be changed, but he said, I believe it can be done with Jesus' power. That's it. Jesus coming into our hearts. You know, if I, had, if I had no proof whatsoever, no scientific proof that Jesus ever lived, I still would trust him because of what he's done for me. The joy and the peace and the security and the love that he's given to me, his grace that is mine today. And then the satisfaction that he gives to those who have trusted him. Who art thou, Lord? Jesus Christ, are you who you say you are? This is the question that every one of you today are going to have to answer. Who is Jesus? If Jesus claimed to be God knowing he wasn't God, then he's a liar. And we will have to say, Jesus, you're a liar. You're a fraud and a hoax and you're the biggest fraud in the history of the human race. Or, if Jesus thought he was God and did not know the difference, then he desperately needed mental help. He needed several psychiatrists. The third alternative is that he was who he claims to be, God in the flesh. I believe that the evidence is overwhelming that he is who he claims to be, the son of the living God. But I cannot prove it scientifically. But I can prove it by the lives that he transforms every day. I can prove it because in my heart, I don't say, I think, I hope, I say, I know. And you know, there's another element in our lives that we don't think much about, and that's the element of faith. You think of the faith that you have to have every day. You have to have faith that your wife didn't put poison in your coffee this morning. You have to have faith in her. She might have felt like it, but she didn't. You have to have faith in the bank. When you write a check and sign it and you have money in the bank, you have to have faith that the bank's going to pay it. You have to have faith in the government. When you pull out a dollar bill, now I know it's shrinking, but you have faith that back of it is a dollar, that people will accept it as money. Everything we do is by faith. Now, for example, when I come up on a hill and I live in the mountains of North Carolina and we have a lot of hills, I don't stop my car before I get to the crest of the hill and get out and walk over and see if somebody's coming up the other side on the wrong side. I have faith to believe that the drivers are going to stay on their side. Faith, 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 everything. When you sat in that chair, had you ever sat in that chair before? I bet you didn't pick it up and examine it and put your hands on it to see if it would hold you. By faith, you just sat down in it. You had faith that people wouldn't build a chair that wouldn't hold you. Everything we do is by faith. All right, take the same faith. Put it in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you will know who Jesus is. You accept him by faith, and he comes into your life and into your heart, and you know that he's who 
he claims to be. On that Damascus road that I referred to a moment ago, the Apostle Paul said, Who art thou, Lord? And then Paul asked him another question. Paul said, What do you want me to do, Lord? And Jesus said, Arise and go. I'm asking you today to arise and come to him. Now, some of you can ridicule. Some of you can reject him. Some can just put it off and say, I'm going to wait till another time. Or you can accept him as your Lord and your Savior and your Master and the Son of God. And he will come into your heart and forgive your sin and change your life. Jesus Christ, superstar. Judas, don't get me wrong, I only want to know, he said. And then the haunting chorus, Jesus Christ, superstar, do you think you are what they say you are? Yes! And more, 10,000 times more than two men in England ever put in those lyrics is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And you are asked today to receive him. In fact, if you're going to go to heaven, the Bible teaches, you have to receive him. If you're going to have your sins forgiven, you have to receive him. And I'm going to ask you to do it today, and I'm going to ask you to do it publicly. How do you do it? I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat right now and come and stand in front of this platform quietly and reverently and say, I want Christ in my heart. I'm going to ask that we bow our heads in prayer, every head bowed and every eye closed. Our Father, we thank Thee that on this beautiful evening Thou hast already been speaking to our hearts, and we pray that Thou wouldst draw many to Thyself tonight, that they may find purpose for their lives, peace and joy in their hearts, and assurance as they face the future. For we ask it in Christ's name, Amen. Now I want you to turn with me to the fifth chapter of Revelation. Revelation is the last book in the Bible. And I'm not going to ask you tonight, but beginning tomorrow night, I'm going to ask how many have brought their Bibles? How many have brought their Bibles? Bring your Bible. We're not here to put on a show. We're not here to entertain you. We are here to teach you what the Bible has to say about the problems that you face in your life in your home, in your community, in the nation, in the world. So bring your Bible. Revelation, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. It's been our privilege to preach the gospel on every continent. We've preached the gospel all across Africa. We've preached the gospel all across Latin America. We've preached the gospel all across Asia. We've preached the gospel all across Europe. And the scripture says in that day they're going to be gathered to sing the new song of salvation, people from every kindred, every tongue, every tribe, Every nation, the Chinese will be there. The Russians will be there. They say that there are no Christians whatsoever in Albania. Don't you be too sure. God had his people in Caesar's household. God's got his people in Albania. There isn't a tribe, there isn't a group, probably in the world, that there isn't somebody that loves God and that loves Christ, though they may not even know his name. You know, when they reached Helen Keller and they talked to her about God, she said, I knew him, but I didn't know his name. She was deaf, she was dumb, she was blind, but deep down inside of every person, they know that there's a God. And I believe that if a person sincerely seeks God with all their heart, God will somehow get that message of the gospel to them. And God uses us to do it. And has made us 
our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, every person that knows Christ is a king, and you're a priest, and you're someday going to reign with Christ on the earth, according to this passage. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels. I've just written a book on angels. Did you know that there are no books on angels? That was a strange thing to me. There are few, a little handful, maybe four or five that you could buy in a dusty part of a bookstore somewhere. Some of them are biblically based and some of them are not. And when I found that out, I decided I was going to write a book on angels. We've got all taken up with the devil and demons and their cult and hundreds of books on that subject. Nothing on angels. My book will be out October 1st, by the way, if you want to go to your bookstore and get it. I'm not putting a plug in, but go get it anyway, because I believe it'll bless you and inspire you to know that they that be with us are more than they that be with them, and that the angels of God are far greater in number and more powerful than the devil and all of his demons. And they're going to win the battle, and we're on their side, and they're on our side. Sing with a loud voice. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Here's a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I've read that chapter, I suppose, a hundred times this year. I've almost memorized the entire chapter because it's almost one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. The glory, the praise, and the honor to the Lamb that was slain and who is someday to be King of kings and Lord of lords and who is going to reign over the whole earth. And you can be sure that when the smoke of battle clears from Armageddon, he will be the one that will be standing there as the leader, the master, the ruler, of the world, and the world will know peace because of him. Now, I want to talk about him for just a moment. I want you to see the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when he finished his first sermon in Nazareth, and after he had read from the Scriptures and finished his commentary, he closed the book and he sat down, and it says all the eyes of the people were fastened on him. I want you to see him tonight several ways. I want you to see him, the one to whom some of you serve, the one that some of you are being called to tonight. I want you to see him first as a creative Christ. The Bible says all things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made. A few weeks ago, I addressed the scientist out at Los Alamos. Experimental Laboratory in Atomic Science. And I was told something very interesting. I think I was the first clergyman ever invited to address them. They said, you know, a few years ago, very few scientists believed in a personal God, but that's all changing now. The scientists from the hard sciences are coming to believe in God. And the Scripture says concerning Christ, for by Him were all things created. That means the grass, the sun that is setting over there, the moon, the stars, the galaxies, the planets, the universe, all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be, they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and he is the one that holds it together. So says Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Thrones, dominions, powers, yes. There are thrones and dominions and powers, not only in this world, but in other worlds. Do I believe that other planets are inhabited? Yes, I do. I believe that there are angels. I believe there are demons. 
And the demon world is highly organized, but so is the angelic world highly organized. And in my study of angels this year, I've come to learn something about these wonderful beings with tremendous power that are agents of God that are to minister to the heirs of salvation. He created the whole thing, the Lord Jesus Christ, made by him and for him, and without him, it would blow to pieces the thing that holds the universe together in its precision that we set our watches by is Jesus Christ. And he's the one that I'm asking you to bow your knee to tonight. Confess him as your Lord and trust him as your Savior. It's all his. He created it all. Sometimes so small, a little insect that you need a microscope to see it. Sometimes so large that our most powerful telescopes cannot see it. But it's all created by him. He's the designer behind all the design, the lawmaker behind all law, the creator behind all creation. When he prepared the heavens, the scripture says, I was there. Before Abraham was, I am. I am that I am. I am the eternal present. Jesus never had a past. He has no future. It's all present with him to you. And I, locked into time and space, there's a future and there's a present and there's a past, but not with Jesus. He's always been. He always will. And we're seeing the drama of our little planet acted out right now. And it's moving toward its last frenzied, frantic moments, perhaps. We can't set dates, but we know the time is drawing near when something has to give. It can't go on like it's going very much longer. And the key to the whole thing is the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe in him? Have you put your trust in him? Our magazines and, and newspapers are filled with stories today about the emptiness of our generation, about the fact that young people are searching for purpose and meaning in their lives. They don't know what it's all about. They don't, that's the reason the world is in such a mess. We don't have a philosophy of life. We don't really know what our purpose is. We don't know why we're even on this planet. We're all confused and we're all mixed up. And so we turn to the occult or we turn to drugs or we turn to sex or we turn to something else to escape. One of the most beautiful movie stars in the world was quoted in the paper last week as saying, I hate to get up every morning. I hate to face a new day. But she said, I hate the nights even more. And she said, if it weren't for my sleeping pills and my whiskey, I don't know what I'd do. And yet everybody thinks she's beautiful, glamorous, wealthy, but miserable inside. One of our comedians was quoted in the press the other day as saying, I have never really spent a happy day. Why? Because you see, the secret of happiness and peace and joy is Christ. The second thing about Christ, I want you to see the creative Christ, the curative Christ. The scripture says he went about doing good. He went about doing good. Wouldn't you like to see a person that did nothing but that just went about doing good? He came to open the eyes of the blind. He came to preach the gospel to the poor. He came to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and so forth. He said that in his first sermon too. And so they brought the blind and the lame and the insane and the demon-possessed. They brought them to him by the thousands, and he healed them all that came across his path. Jesus never met a human need that he did not supply. We have three great needs today. You do, I do. There's physical disease. A lady was in to see me just a moment ago and she's going for an operation to the hospital tomorrow. She needs prayer 
as we all do when we go into the hospital. My brother went into the operating room four months ago to have brain surgery, and he's had three brain operations since then. Thank God it was not malignant, and thank God he's getting well. But it's been a long process. He's been on antibiotics for four solid months. He's testified on our television program before, and I appreciate the prayers of thousands of you that have prayed for my brother Melvin. And God has answered prayer and restoring him to health, and I believe it's because of prayer. But look in the Bible. That leper, leprosy in those days, incurable. They had to go around saying, unclean, unclean, unclean. They were social outcasts. And Jesus not only spoke to the leper, Jesus touched him. And he was immediately healed. And Jesus will touch you. But they brought a palsied man to Jesus, a paralyzed man to Jesus. And Jesus surprised everybody by saying, Thy sins have forgiven thee. That man didn't ask to have his sins forgiven. He wanted healing. But Jesus said, You've got a deeper need than your physical need. You've got a spiritual need. And there's some of you in hospital beds right now watching this program. And you do have a physical need in that hospital bed. But you have a deeper need, and you need the great surgeon, the physician, the great physician to come into your heart and forgive your sins. You need to surrender to him right now because you have a greater need than physical need. A second need that we have is psychological need. The Philippian jailer came running before Paul and Silas and fell down and he was about to commit suicide when they were ready to escape, it seemed to him. And he was filled with fear. He was trembling. He was shaking from head to foot. What is your psychological problem? What's your hang-up? Fear? Anxiety? Hate? Hate? Jesus came to heal, to touch, to take it out, to bring it under control. Yield your life to him. And then we have spiritual disease. You see, there was a fellow by the name of Nicodemus, and Nicodemus was a professor of theology over at the seminary. And Nicodemus was wonderfully religious. But he came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I, there's something lacking in my life. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you know what you need? You need to be born again. You tithe, you go to the church not only on the Sabbath, but you go to church all during the week. You live a good life. You're a moral man. But that's not enough for the kingdom of God. Because you see, Nicodemus, even a seminary professor like you is a sinner, and you need a new birth. You need a new heart. Have you been born again? Deacon, elder, steward, pastor. I was in West Texas this past week, and I, was, I addressed the clergy in one of the West Texas cities, and I was telling them about one of their own clergymen that told me. He was a Presbyterian clergyman. And he said that one day he was preaching, and he said he got converted under his own preaching. That's a fact. He's pastor of a great large Presbyterian church up north now, but he was in West Texas. He said, I'd been through seminary. And he said, I hear I had this large church. And one Sunday morning, he said, I knew something was wrong. He said, I had it in my head, but I didn't have it in my heart. And many of you have it in your head, but you don't have it in your heart. You go to Sunday school, you go to church, but somehow the reality of the presence and person of Christ is not there. You need to be born again. Well, how in the world can you be born again, said Nicodemus. I can't get in my mother's womb and be born all over. Jesus said, I'm not talking about physical birth. I'm talking about spiritual birth. You can be born into the spirit world and become a child of God, an heir of salvation, and have a personal relationship with Christ. I suspect that everybody, almost everybody in this stadium is a member of the church. When I received Christ as my Savior and Lord, I was a member of the church in such good standing, they made me first treasurer of the Young People's Society, and then they made me the vice president. And then finally, I ended up president. 
They sent me off to the conferences. They said, why, he's one of the finest boys we've got in the church. But they didn't know what I was doing on Saturday night. And one day I found Christ. And the preacher, by the way, that I thought was the dullest old preacher in the world, when I went back to hear him after my conversion to Christ, I thought he's one of the greatest preachers I ever heard. I was listening through new ears, a new heart, a new mind, a new attitude. And that's what Christ offers to all of you that'll come to him. Have you ever said to yourself, the problems are just too great for me? I just can't handle them. The pressures of life, the children screaming, my husband comes home angry. My husband sits in front of the TV all night, pays no attention to me, gets up in the morning, reads the paper while I'm fixing breakfast and we have no relationship whatsoever. And it's just too much for me. I'm just going to give up. How many of you are like that? Give your life to Christ and have a whole new dimension in your life. I know a couple, he's a famous surgeon. He told me this story himself. He and his wife were breaking up. They'd already filed for divorce. They had a son that was over in Europe on drugs. They had another child that was down at one of the southern universities, out totally away from God. They had tried to keep up a respectable membership in the Methodist church where they went to. But finally, even that just broke apart, and everybody knew that that they'd had it. So they were having a lay mission in the Methodist church, and some of the laymen came to give their testimony, and this doctor decided he'd go back to church, and so he went to church, and he sat there, and he listened, and God spoke to him, and when they gave the appeal, he went forward. Unknown to him, his wife was also in the audience, and she had come forward, and they met at the altar. Now, that's a fashionable Methodist church that I'm talking about. But they had turned it into an old-fashioned altar like they used to do. And they grabbed each other, and they hugged each other, and they felt a tap on their shoulders, and they looked around, and there was their son, who they thought was in Europe. He had come forward, too. And at that very hour, their other son was walking across the campus at Duke University in North Carolina, and he ran into a Christian. And that Christian began to witness to him, and that Christian led him to Christ. And that son called that afternoon and said, Dad said, you won't believe what's happened to me, and said, I wish it could happen to you and the rest of the family, but I've just found Jesus Christ. That all happened, touched by Christ. A family saved by Christ. Are the pressures in your family life just too great? Let Christ come into your heart. And then thirdly, there is the crucified Christ. The crucified Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ went to the cross for you. He died on that cross in your place. You know, crucifixion is the worst of all the horrible forms of death that man has ever invented hanging, the electric chair, the gas chamber, those things are nothing compared to crucifixion. Death by crucifixion was a lingering death which took many hours and many days. Vultures would begin to circle. All decency was abandoned. Not a scrap of clothing was left on the victim. And the mocking and the scoffing and the insults. And Jesus had said, think not that if I would pray that I could asked for 12 legions of angels, and they'd come. Did you know that the angels were with Jesus at every turn of his life except one place? That was the cross. He died alone. And he died worse than any man that ever lived. Why? Because he not only died physically, but he died spiritually for you. He took your sins and your dirt and your filth. He took it on the cross, all the dirty words that have ever been spoken, all the dirty thoughts, all the pornographic literature, everything that's ever been done wrong. He took on that cross, every war that was ever fought, every social injustice that there ever was, he took on that cross. And he said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He took your sins. 
Now, your sin seems to be a little sin, doesn't it? Greed, pride, selfishness, maybe once in a while a little sex on the side. Not too bad, but those little sins are big in the sight of God. And they'll keep you out of heaven, and they'll send you to hell. And we're all guilty. And Christ died on the cross, and God somehow, I don't know how, mysteriously, he took your sins and mine, and he took them and put them on Christ. And Christ became the scapegoat. And that's why he's called in the Scripture the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. The Lamb that would have its neck slit and the blood would flow on the Jewish sacrificial altars. Jesus became the mighty Lamb of God for you. And you must receive it by faith. Receive what he did by faith on that cross. But he also became the conquering Christ. He became the conquering Christ. Because he didn't stay on the cross, they buried him. But on the third day he rose again, and there you have the angels again. They made the greatest announcement the world has ever known. He is not here. He is risen. Christ is alive. All that has been happening in Indochina hasn't taken him by surprise. All the things that are happening in the world hasn't taken him by surprise. He's alive. He's watching. He's waiting for that precise moment when the cup of iniquity is filled, when the last soul shall be saved, when the last sermon will be preached, when the last tribe shall be evangelized, whenever that moment is known only to God the Father, the Son is going to return. And so we have him as the coming Christ. He said, I will come again. In such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye will see him. Yes, Christ is coming. But in the meantime, he is the contemporary Christ, the living Christ in the world today, changing lives, forgiving sin, transforming families, and he can touch your life. He is so contemporary, he is so up to date that he can change your life tonight if you let him. You say, Billy, you don't really know all about me. No, I don't know anything about you. You don't know the things I've done and the hypocrisy in my life. You don't know the mess our family's in. You don't know the tensions that we face. You don't know the things that I've done that even my parents don't know. Or my wife doesn't know. Do you think God could really forgive me? You don't know the habit I'm into. You don't, you don't know this thing that's got a grip on me. I do know that Jesus taught that sin is slavery, you can become a slave to sin. And some of you are slaves right now. But the moment you give your life to Christ, the Bible says that sin is no longer on the throne. Sin is no longer the dictator. Sin is no longer king. Sin and the devil are dethroned in your life. Christ is on the throne. Christ rules. Christ reigns. And I start every day by saying, Lord, I want you to direct this day. I surrender this day to you. And it's a wonderful thing to walk through every day and to know that God is leading and God is directing. It's wonderful to go through every day and know that God has his protective host around you and nothing can touch a hair of your head without his permission. It's wonderful to have that serenity of heart and that peace of soul. It's wonderful to have him come and lift that burden. It's wonderful to have him come and forgive that sin and heal that breach between husband and wife. I'm going to ask you tonight to come and give your life to Christ. You say, but Billy, what do I have to do? I'm going to tell you what you have to do. You have to be willing to humble yourselves. 
You can't come proudly with your shoulders back and say, look here, Lord, I, you sure are lucky to get me. You've got to humble yourself. And you've got to say, Lord, yes, I'm a sinner. I failed. And you've got to be willing to give up your sins and change your way of life and turn, that means turn, by faith. Notice, by faith. You can't do it intellectually alone. By faith, you receive Jesus Christ as your only Lord and your only Savior. Now, some of you have already received him as Savior, but you've never received him as Lord. Lord of your life to rule, to reign, to control every moment of every day. Some of you have never received him as Savior or Lord. During the last war, the city of Berlin probably took more punishment than any other city in Germany. When the war was over, nothing but rubble and ruin remained. However, standing high in the midst of the rubble was a church steeple that had been left standing. And on top of that church steeple was a high cross that acted as a beacon light to all the suffering, bereaved, and tragic stricken people. This cross helped inspire the people of Berlin to rebuild their city. Today as never before, the world needs to look to the cross for guidance and direction. I saw a cartoon the other day in which it depicted the black clouds of war gathering on the horizon and only one beacon light shining through. In the midst of the beacon light was a cross indicating that here was man's hope. No New Testament statement stands out in bolder relief than the words of the Apostle Paul who said, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I remember when I first started my work in evangelism. That was the second sermon that I prepared was on Galatians 6, 14, glorying in the cross. Paul might have been justified in being exultant about many things, for he was a man of many gifts. By any man's estimate, he was the greatest missionary of all time. He was a skilled linguist, an astute logician, a clever debater, and a masterful orator, but he did not find it within his heart to glory in any of these. When the mood for glorying struck him, he said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why did Paul glory in that torture symbol of criminal death? What beauty did he see in the rough-hewn beam that had always been associated with suffering and shame? How could he glory in that which had always been accursed? The answer is the mystery and marvel of him who on that cross loved us and gave himself for us. The river of history moves on, but the cross remains. When the strong torture the weak, when the poor cry for bread, when the innocent suffer in dungeons, when mothers go insane because they see their children die, as in East Pakistan, when soldiers go to battle, when those sit in darkness and pray for light, the cross always returns with a power and a glory to those who put their trust and their faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, the cross of Jesus Christ is the central point of history. It is the X mark etched by the hand of God himself on the map of the world to show where a sinless Savior bore the penalty of a sinful race. Modern man glories in his unprecedented scientific achievements. He glories in his material possessions. He glories in his independence from traditions of the past. And he glories that he is now able to probe out of space. But the riddle of man's spirit, the problem of man himself, cannot be resolved apart from the cross of Christ. That's why true Christians all over the world sing, in the cross of Christ I glory, towering o'er the wrecks of time. All the light of sacred story gathers round his head sublime. Why did Paul glory in the cross? Why is the cross the symbol of Christianity? And why do Christians across the world glory in the cross, not only on Good Friday, but every day? The reason is four wonderful things that were accomplished on that first Good Friday. And they're just as valid today as they were in Paul's day. The first is redemption. The word redemption in its biblical usage refers to the sum paid to redeem a condemned person. Under Roman custom, it was possible to pay the market price of a slave. And instead of using him as a slave, he could free him. Old Roman documents revealed that this custom was common practice. 
We have Christ's own words to show that his mission to the world was one of ransom and redemption. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, he said, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He beheld men bound by Satan, chained by appetite and lust, slaves of evil, and in some wonderful way known only to God, upon that cross he paid the ransom. The second reason why we glory in the cross is that it accomplished propitiation. Now that's a big word, it's a theological word, but it has a tremendous meaning. Now to the average person they may not understand it, but it indicates that our Lord on the cross through his death met the demands of the moral law of the universe and took the sins of the world upon himself. The Bible says, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Some people have an idea that Jesus Christ died only for white people or for black people or for yellow people or that Jesus Christ died only for Christians. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lord Jesus Christ died for everybody, for all races, all colors. Whatever their circumstances, he died for every man. The law, like a mirror, reveals our faults and our sins, but it's powerless to cleanse us from them. Christ came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, to bridge the gap between God and man, and to be a propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means covering. He covered our sins so that God can no longer see them. The Bible says, God hath set forth him to be a covering through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now the phrase, the forbearance of God, indicates that God himself was suffering with his son as he became sin for a sinful world. The cross, then, becomes the magnificent manifestation of the love, the patience, and the long-suffering of God, who was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. When a member of a family does wrong, the whole family suffers. But when a member of a family performs a noble deed, every member profits. Adam sinned, and the human race suffered. But Christ triumphed over sin. And to us who were weighed in the balances of God's justice and found wanting, the cross tipped the scales in our favor. And he became our propitiation, our covering for sin. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, says 1 Corinthians 5.22. No wonder that in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, his glory reaches a grand crescendo as 10,000 times 10,000s and thousands of thousands singing with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. The third reason why we glory in the cross is because it brought reconciliation. Now the word to reconcile means literally to bring into a changed relationship. It means to bring two parties together who should have been together all along. The Bible speaks of the human race as enemies of God. The Bible says, for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. You say that you're no enemy of God, but according to the Bible you're either a passive or an active enemy of God. You may be a wicked sinner who has continually rebelled against God and refused to listen to his truth, but on the other hand, you may be a good, upstanding, and moral person who is trusting in your own self-righteousness for salvation. You've not been willing to come as a little child to the cross for forgiveness and redemption. God considers you just as much an enemy as he does the vilest sinner. In fact, Christ's most scathing denunciations were against the Pharisees who thought that they did not need to be justified. Reconciliation means being brought back into full relationship and fellowship with God. This is what Christ accomplished on the cross in reconciliation. The scripture says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Christ is the one who makes this reconciliation possible. What a thrilling thought it is to know that we who were separated by sin from God can now be brought back into full fellowship with him 
through the cross. But I want to warn you that God will meet you only at the cross. God has conditions on this reconciliation. His love through the centuries toward the human race has remained unchanged. He longs for our fellowship. He longs for our friendship. But if we come to him, we must acknowledge that we've been wrong and must be willing to turn from our sins and cling only to the cross for redemption. Now, the fourth reason we glory in the cross is because through it, we obtain justification. Justification is another big word. Justification is something that God does for us in response to a changed attitude. In Luke 18, we see two moving pictures of two men. One a Pharisee who persists in his false piety, and the other a publican who admits his sins but begs a merciful God for forgiveness. The Bible says that when the publican cried, God be merciful to me, a sinner, this man went up to his house justified. Thus the age-old question of how should man be justified with God is answered in Jesus Christ. You can be justified even though you're a sinner. You've broken every one of the Ten Commandments. You know you're a sinner, but you can be placed in God's sight as though you'd never committed one sin because of the cross. The Bible teaches that even though God is a God of love and mercy, he is also a God of justice. The scripture says justice is the habitation of his throne in Psalm 97. Man is a lawbreaker. He needs more than forgiveness, more than cleansing. He needs a pardon. He needs to be placed before God as though he had never sinned. This is justification. Thus, justification goes far beyond forgiveness. I may forgive a man, but I can never justify a man. The word justification means just as if I had never sinned. It means that I have been counted clear. It means that in God's sight, I'm placed as though I'd never committed a sin. The Bible teaches that we cannot be justified by our good works. The scripture says, therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But we are justified. We are justified through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus purchased our justification by his death on the cross. The scripture says, justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Notice the word grace. The grace means unmerited favor, something you don't deserve. He gives it to you free. It was all done on the cross. Now, the reason that God can forgive us is because God's justice has been satisfied more abundantly than if you had suffered the pains of hell. The Bible teaches that the way of justification is by faith. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Though justification is affected only by divine action, it becomes operative in the lives of individuals only when they believe. Thus, we have four words centered today in the cross. Redemption, propitiation, reconciliation, and justification. These are the words that come to us from that hill outside Jerusalem's gates and give us cause to glory in the cross of Christ today. And as we stand at this confused and lawless period of history, when millions are wringing their hands and saying, what are we going to do? We have a beacon light in the cross as true believers in Jesus Christ. You can share by receiving Christ as your Savior. And in the midst of our world, you can have a peace that passeth understanding and a joy that is beyond comprehension if you put your faith and your confidence in the grace and love of God as expressed in Jesus Christ on that cross. Now, we cannot talk about the cross without talking about the resurrection because Jesus Christ rose again. He is alive at this moment, willing to come and live in your heart and give you a new direction and a new dimension in your life if you will put your trust and confidence in him. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that thy Holy Spirit will take this message and apply it to the hearts of those that are listening. And may many this day throughout the world find the Christ of this cross as their Savior.
for we ask it in his name. Amen. I want you to turn the third chapter of Exodus, the third verse. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. He saw a bush that was burning, but it was not being consumed. And God spoke to him out of the bush and told him that he was to go to Egypt and help lead the Jewish people or the Israelis who had been slaves for 400 years. You know, we get the idea that all the slaves came from Africa. No. Many nations have suffered slavery in different color skins. And one of those was the Israel. They were slaves of the Egyptians for 400 years. And God said, I'm going to send Moses down to lead them out. And he was on his way. And Moses was afraid. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you? And God said, Moreover, Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. I am that I am. The mighty God of heaven, speaking to earthly men. And Jesus later finished that sentence when he came. Hundreds of years later. And he used that word I am seven times in the book of John alone. And I want to look at some of those I am's. The first one he says, I am the bread of life in John 6.35. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. You have some wonderful bread here in the restaurants I've eaten in. I've been here much longer than you know. I came here before the crusade began several days to walk around a little bit disguised to see what you look like and see what it felt like to be in San Antonio and to remember those wonderful historic days of the Alamo. But Jesus wasn't talking about physical hunger. Jesus said believers have starved to death and are doing so in some parts of the world even today. He was talking about spiritual death. Jesus had a great concern about physical body hunger. He fed the people that couldn't feed themselves. He fed 5,000 men at one time besides all the women and children. And all they had was a few loaves and a couple fish. And it, it kept multiplying as he handed it. And when it was over, there were 12 baskets full left over. Man has an inborn hunger, not only for physical food, but he has a hunger for spiritual food. St. Augustine said long ago, Thou hast made us for thyself, and the heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Have you eaten of the spiritual bread that Jesus came to give? Many of you have not. But when you come to Jesus, he gives you spiritual bread. And that spiritual bread is the food that you need for daily life. And it's the food that you need to get you to heaven. And he is the bread. Have you ever received him into your heart?
Then he said in John 8, 12, I'm the light of the world. Now I'm told by some scientists that we really don't know what light is. Other scientists disagree. But we do know it by its effects. We know that there could be no plant, animal, or human life upon this earth without light. I would hate to think what it would be in this building without light tonight. God put the sun in precise balance and distance from the world. What the sun is to the earth, Jesus Christ is to the human heart. He brings warmth and light and helps us to direct our paths and guides us in our lives. And this light takes us, shows us the way to heaven. And then Jesus used that word again, I am that I am. He said, I am the door. Every house and every building has an entrance. The kingdom of God has an entrance too. Only one. And that's Jesus Christ. He said, I am the door. Have you been through that door? The way you get to that door is to turn from your sin, that's repentance, and say to God, I'm sorry I've sinned. I'm willing to give up the wrong things in my life and I'm willing to follow Christ with your help. God, I don't have the strength to do it, but if you'll help me, I'll do it. I'll change my way of life. As a carpenter, Jesus had probably made many doors while a building like this building here has many doors, many entrances, yet the kingdom of God has only one and you have to walk through that door and you can't walk through that door unless the Holy Spirit leads you and guides you. Jesus will reach out and take your hand and take you through that door into the kingdom of heaven and you'll be there forever. The Bible says there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Jesus said someone that climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The door to heaven is Jesus Christ himself. Have you been through that door? And then the fourth time he used that expression, I am that I am. I am the vine, he said. He said that in the upper room in the last supper, the last time he was to be with his disciples. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Without me you cannot do anything toward getting to heaven. Now sat is in the life of the vine. The Holy Spirit comes into your heart the moment you receive Christ by faith and he begins to produce fruit. He produces love and the world needs love tonight more than anything. We're never going to solve our racial problems in the world until we love one another and only the Holy Spirit can produce that kind of love. He also produces joy. And how we need joy today, true joy, and peace, and patience, and gentleness, and goodness, and faith, and self-control. That's done supernaturally by the Holy Spirit when you come to Christ by faith and open your heart and your life to Him. Jesus said, my joy will be yours. Do you have the joy of the Lord in your heart tonight? The dead branch of your empty life can be grafted into the true vine and you can live in him. And then fifthly he said, I am the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He lived in a world 
of sheep and goats and shepherds. Sheep could not exist in those days without a shepherd. They'd fall prey to the wolves and the wild dogs and the lions and the thieves. They would wander and become lost without a shepherd. There are many people in the church that don't really know Christ. They come to church because it's the thing to do. They come to Christ because they're still seeking. Even in the church they haven't found. I was baptized and confirmed in the church. But I had a void in my heart. Somehow a voice said to me, you haven't gone all the way. There's something else that you need. What I really needed was to repent of my sin and receive Christ by faith and make it a personal matter between me and Christ. And that's what happened. And it changed my life. The Good Shepherd sought the lost sheep at great personal sacrifice upon the cross. And when Christ died on the cross and shed his blood, he was dying for our sins. He was dying in your place because the scripture teaches Without Christ, we're lost. We've broken the laws of God and we've sinned. We deserve judgment. We deserve hell. But Jesus took the place that we were supposed to take. He was made to be sin for us. He said, I lay down my life for the sheep. We're the sheep and he laid down his life for us. And when you look at the cross, you're looking at the worst suffering that the world knows anything about. Because Jesus not only suffered physically, he suffered spiritually because he actually went to hell for you. And for me, he took a spiritual death as well as a physical death. It's more than just a cross that we wear around our neck or look at as a beautiful thing of art or just something on a church steeple. The cross carried with it the greatest meaning the world has ever known and meant that God says, I love you. In spite of your sins, I love you. I forgive you. Come into my home. Come to heaven. What a glorious time that's going to be. Do you know Christ that way? Has that happened to you? And then the sixth time he used it, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. A famous newspaper columnist wrote some time ago that he had cancer and he was terminally ill. And he decided that in his column every day, he would write his experience. He described in graphic terms his feelings of emptiness, lostness, helplessness. With Christ, you can live not only until you die, but you can live through death to be with him forever. Why should people say that we cannot rise again? We've just celebrated Easter. Which is more difficult to be born or to rise again? Jesus said to Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus rose from the dead right then on the command of Jesus. And someday Jesus is going to say that to all people who put their confidence and their trust in him. He'll say, come forth. And the graves will break open. And we will be with him forever. Tonight, and then lastly, Jesus summed it all up. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way. I am the way of life. I'm the way to heaven. I'm the way of the future. He also said, I am the truth. I'm the embodiment of all truth. 
We're still searching for truth in every area of life. Every area of study, we're searching for truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. And when Jesus Christ came to this earth, it was God coming in human form for the purpose of dying on the cross and rising again for our salvation. How can there be such love? There's never been such an expression of love in the history of the universe. I imagine those other galaxies watched in absolute amazement that the mighty God of all heaven and creation should come to this little planet because he loves you and me. How do you respond? Jesus tells us how to respond. There are three things you need to do. First, repent of sin. Now a lot of people don't know what it means to repent, what the word means. It means to tell God, I have sinned. I'm sorry I've sinned. I'm willing to change my way of life if you will help me, Lord. I can't do it by myself. I don't have the strength to do it, but I can. I will if you will help me. That's the first thing, repentance. The second thing is faith. Just believe. Now that word believe means more than just saying I believe. It means that you put your total weight on. You put your weight on Christ and you trust him and him alone for your forgiveness and for salvation and for the assurance of heaven. And you've been asked to turn from your own sins and turn your life over to him and he will forgive and change you and make you a new person if you let him. I'm going to ask you to do something we asked people to come last night and hundreds did. I'm going to ask you to make a commitment tonight that you are going to repent and receive him if God will help you. He has to help you in the believing and the repenting. And ask him to make you a new person. A Buffalo psychiatrist said two weeks ago that more than 80% of the people living in New York need mental treatment. Dr. Marvin K. Obler, University of Buffalo professor, said that an intensive eight-year study of Midtown Manhattan disclosed a mental problem facing every metropolitan area in the country. According to this study, only 18% of the people were free from mental disturbance symptoms. There is no doubt that mental illness and disturbance has become one of the greatest problems facing America today. Ralph McGill, editor of the Atlanta Constitution, writing two weeks ago, said, Psychologists probing the minds of young Americans come up with conclusions that are by no means wholly reassuring. Recently, a Gallup poll study of a cross-section of 3,000 young Americans between the ages of 14 and 22 was published. The average young American the pollsters deduced from their controlled questions is a pampered hothouse plant and likes it that way. In the problem of delinquency, the psychologists have come up with still another conclusion. In the March issue of Teachers College Record, a review of books on delinquency quotes one expert study as concluding, the delinquent gang is rooted in destructive resentment of middle-class rewards that are seductively stressed through all our media, including the schools, but that in fact are denied to them. In still another field, Dr. John McIver, Assistant Medical Director of the United States Steel Corporation in Pittsburgh, said in a speech the other day, alcoholism is the biggest single behavior problem in industry. In Miami, Florida last week, it was revealed that the FBI had uncovered a gigantic smuggling ring operating out of Cuba. They were smuggling heroin and marijuana into the United States. There's no doubt that we have become the object of a gigantic satanic master plan to destroy the moral fabric of this country. Pornography is now openly sold on thousands of newsstands throughout the country. Our movies are filled with more filth and pollution than ever before. Crime is on a rampage and Mr. J. Edgar Hoover says it's out of control. 
A psychiatrist in Hollywood said recently, there is more strain and unhappiness than ever before. This is illustrated by the stories in Rome during the past few weeks of America's sex goddess, Elizabeth Taylor, and her new romance. What were considered ideal Hollywood marriages are breaking up, such as Dinah Shore and George Montgomery, or Tony Curtis and Janet Lee. Everywhere we turn, there's trouble, breakdown, and disturbance in the moral fabric of the American people. At this hour of deep personal and national trouble, where are the American people turning for help? Most reports indicate that we should go to see more psychiatrists. Already, psychiatrists are overworked. In the Los Angeles phone book, there are three pages of psychiatrists listed, and most of their offices are filled. Most of our major universities today employ a number of psychiatrists just to deal with the students and faculty. The word psychology is a much used and much misused word. It covers a multitude of popular misconceptions, pseudo-scientific ideas, and scientific hypotheses concerning human life and experience. Many people have an idea that psychiatry is a magic. They think that the psychiatrist has a kit bag of magic tricks to play on people. They think of him as a person who has a magical word to give or a fairy wand to wave over their troubles. But this is not true. We are desperately in need of more dedicated Christian psychiatrists. But the vast majority of our mental and emotional disturbances in this country could be solved by a genuine encounter with the living Christ. The basic root of our problem is sin. And sin is a disease. It affects our minds. It upsets the mental equilibrium. The Apostle Paul uses the phrase mystery of iniquity or the mystery of lawlessness to describe the symptoms of the society of our day. To read of the crime, the injustice, the intolerance, the greed, the deception, and the lust which plagues man is bewildering and perplexing. The Christian's heart is heavy when he hears of the broken homes, the wasted lives, and the shattered hopes and dreams which are the product of evil. In the world, most of us have friends, neighbors, and relatives who are suffering from the strains and problems of everyday living. Even a child can see a principle of lawlessness, iniquity, and sin abroad in the world today. The Bible teaches, as I've said often on this program, that the mystery of iniquity is the power unseen, unknown except by its effects, which is ever working in the world for evil. We try to trace evil back to its origin, and we soon see that there's a mysterious element to it. The Bible teaches that God did not create evil and sin, that somewhere in the mysterious past it began with Lucifer, son of the morning, rebelling against God. There's a mystery to it all. We see the results of sin everywhere. The Bible does not try to explain sin, but assumes its existence. Alongside the blessings in the Garden of Eden, there has sprung up a counter curse on all our race in the increase and multiplication of sin. The seeds of evil are propagated from parent to child, each little one bringing into the world as his spiritual inheritance a propensity to evil, which mingles with all his propensities to good. The wheat and the tares grow together. The good and the evil are side by side in every one of us. Each new life seems eventually to bring a new contribution to the already abundant growth of evil. It is a mere germ at first, expressing itself in the rebelling against the mother, the slapping at the father, the tendency toward lying and rebellion against all authority on the part of even the youngest children. It is just a germ at first, but unfolding speedily, growing with the growth of the child. Thus the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that we're all sinners and that we're all caught up in this spirit of iniquity. It is this mystery of iniquity that is sweeping across the world. However, the Bible teaches that sin is not an essential element in the constitution of our humanity, as many of our modern educators are saying. We know that it was not in man originally, nor will it be in the man of the future who is in the kingdom of God. Neither did sin exist in the man Christ Jesus, and yet there is scarcely a fact of which we are more conscious than the presence of evil. It meets us on every hand. Its dislocating influence is seen and felt by all. Sin is no figment of the imagination. It's a terrible reality. It is no vague, indefinite shadow. It is a real and specific evil. Nor are we to regard sin as a necessary constituent of our moral progress. 
Some people have an idea that it serves in the process of our spiritual development. But sin is not an essential element in our moral training or spiritual advancement. We need not sin that grace may abound. We need not be under its power nor defiled by its taint in order to be advancing in knowledge or growing in humility, as some modern educators are saying. The Bible teaches that sin basically is selfishness and rebellion against God. Man through sin has not only become wounded, but he has become alienated from God. He has been brought into an attitude of positive antagonism to God. Sin is not something which appeals to pity only. It is not just a major human misfortune. It is that which deserves punishment, for it is rebellion against the purity, goodness, and majesty of God. If sin were not an offense, we would conceive of the mercy of God forgiving sin without any sacrifice. But the necessity of a sacrifice teaches us that sin is a violation of God's law. The Bible teaches in John 1, 3 to 4, that sin is the transgression of the law. And by the law we are to understand not only the old Mosaic law of the Old Testament, but also the law of the New Testament in Christ. But even more than that, the law of conscience in our hearts. All of this embraces the whole complex commandment. Sin consists essentially in the want of conformity to the will of God, which the law reveals. It is lawlessness, a breach of the law, and thus it is the law that reveals the sinfulness of sin. The Bible tells us that all those who are guilty of sin will be judged and eventually banished from the kingdom of God. The Bible teaches there is a hell, a hell in this life and a hell to come to those who reject God's offer of mercy. This is all a result of sin. The Bible teaches that our sins will find us out, that whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The Bible teaches that our sins find us out in this life and in the life to come. Sometimes the term sin is used in Scripture with reference to acts of sin. This, however, is not the only sense in which sin is spoken of. It is also referred to as a power dwelling and working inside of people. Transgression, therefore, must not be limited to outward violations of the Ten Commandments. It also includes all those inner activities of the soul which are opposed to the mind and character of God. This includes your imaginations, your thoughts and intents and motives. Jesus taught this when he indicated that the law of Moses taught that adultery was wrong. But he said that if you even have lust in your heart, you're guilty of that sin. In the sixth chapter of Romans, it is indicated that sin is a ruling power. Sin is personified as one who seeks to have lordship over our lives. Thus, sin has not only brought upon man the penalty due to sin as an offense, it has enslaved him under sin as a ruling principle. Sin is a power that has entered into the central citadel of man's being and has established itself there. Sin has brought every part of man's nature under its sway. Thus, sin reigns over the entire man, and the body is the instrument through which sin carries out its work. Our bodies are in sin's possession and under sin's control. Many of you would ask, why does God allow sin to continue? Why does he hold us responsible for our sins if it is a mystery of iniquity that we cannot help? The Bible, however, teaches that we are free moral agents. God did not create us as a piece of machinery so that he could push a button and we would obey him. He created us in his moral image. All have wills of our own. God does not hold us responsible altogether for the sin of Adam. When we reach the age of accountability, we make our own moral choices. And the Bible teaches that we have all made the wrong choice. We have all sinned against God. The scripture teaches that if we offend in one point, we're guilty of all. And we're all involved. However, great is the mystery of iniquity, there's still another mystery that is even greater. It is called in the Bible the mystery of godliness, the secret, unseen, unmeasured power which lies in the cross of Christ. As we approach Holy Week, we will read many sermons and see many illustrations of the power of the cross. The Bible says that he had made him to become sin for us, that knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In that awful hour of darkness at the cross, in a mysterious and glorious way, Christ was made sin for us. He bore our penalty. He died in our place. 
There he bore the guilt and shame of mankind so that all who believe in him might not perish but have everlasting life. If you want to know how black and hideous sin is in the sight of God, take a long look at the cross. There are those today that say that God will excuse sin. He will wink at it. He will forgive it. There are others who think that God will say that it was a psychological blunder. But God does not excuse sin. He considers it so terrible that he sent his son to the cross to die for it. The cross of Christ is God's guarantee to men everywhere that there is hope of redemption and salvation. Among the last words of Jesus from the cross were those spoken to the thief. From the lips of a dying thief came the words, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And to this plea, Jesus answered, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. To all of you that are disillusioned, confused, bewildered, and beset by temptation and sin, Christ offers the hope of forgiveness. To all of you that are suffering the stress and strain of the complex life in which we live, He offers assurance, peace, and joy. To you who wrestle with a thousand moral and intellectual problems, He offers peace of mind, power, joy, unspeakable and full of glory. Paul, writing to the Corinthians concerning the cross, said that to the Greeks who were searching for an intellectual panacea, they would consider the cross foolishness. Today, when I tell you that in the cross there is power to change your life, some of you will laugh and say it's impossible. Whether we like to admit it or not, you and I had a part in crucifying Christ. The cross is the eternal exposure and condemnation of all that crucifies the Spirit of Christ and hinders God's purpose in the world today. All the motives that made the wounds of Christ bleed in each succeeding generation were represented at Calvary. Pride, arrogance, the sin of the closed mind, apathy and indifference, worldliness, pseudo-culture, cynicism, and disillusioned idealism, perversion of law and order and of morality itself, as well as a host of other things were represented in the various groups of people who conspired to bring Jesus Christ to the cross. The cauldron of hatred, which seethed at the foot of the cross, contained all the ingredients that make up the Christ-crucifying spirit rampant in our age in 1962. Whether we like it or not, we are linked by chains of motive to those who crucified Jesus Christ. The words of the old spiritual are pertinent to ourselves as with Paul we contemplate again the spectacle of the cross this week and ponder its cosmic meaning. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? There can be but one answer. It is the prayer of the publican in the parable that Jesus told. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. On the cross, God in Christ takes upon himself the penalty, shame, and consequences of your sin. And on the cross, God reveals forever his method of dealing with it. He meets it and masters it by an overwhelming passion of cleansing, forgiving, and redeeming love. It was at the cross that God was in Christ exerting himself to the utmost to breach the gulf created between God and man by sin. No other power in the world had done it. No other power can do it today. Such a reconciliation lies far beyond the power of any psychiatrist. The essence of that cross is forgiveness and it's forgiveness that you need. You receive forgiveness and the assurance of forgiveness, it will change your life. Try it and see. Come in repentance of your sin and faith in Christ and see what he can do for you today. Shall we pray? Our Father, help us to realize that at this hour, the secret of transformed living is in the cross of Jesus Christ. May we come in simple childlike faith and let him transform our lives this day. And may we come to Easter realizing its significance more than ever before. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.